Hello all of you, welcome back again. I am Samapti Sina Mahapatra, your Zoology teacher from Shri Chaitanya Institute. Students, today we are going to discuss a very interesting chapter of physiology that is the second chapter, breathing and exchange of gases. Now, first of all, let us see what is the probable number of questions that could be expected in NEET 2020 this year. So, since I already said that this chapter is not only this chapter, the entire physiology is quite very much important for NEET. So, probably, you know, there is a repetition of at least two questions, three questions every year from this chapter as well. So, we are expecting at least two to three questions from this chapter also. Alright, now since it is very very important, so I would want all of you to keep your ears open, eye open as well and let's just begin with the class. As the chapter itself is having the terms breathing and exchange, we all know that breathing is very very important just like digestion, right? So after digesting, after having your food, you, you know, broke down your food into simple components, you absorbed everything. How did you get energy students? Now for that energy, you required what is called as oxygen. But often we get confused between these two terms that what is breathing and what is this respiration. So first, let us start with what is called as breathing. Students, breathing is also called as ventilation. And when we specifically talk about breathing, we mean by this is it is simple inhalation and exhalation. So it's simply inhaling air and exhaling out the air, inhaling some oxygen and exhaling out most of the CO2, that's breathing. But when we specifically talk about respiration, respiration is the breakdown of food, breakdown of food using that oxygen that you took inside. And that is oxidation of food to provide you with energy. Now respiration can be again categorized into two types. One category is internal respiration and another category is called as external respiration. Now when you talk about external respiration that's when you are talking about some exchange that is taking place between your alveoli and your pulmonary capillary. And while talking about that, you know, in that level in your lungs, what is happening is you are uploading all your oxygen and you're uploading all the oxygen giving to the blood. And from the blood, you are unloading all the CO2. Exactly that's what is external respiration. Uploading the oxygen and unloading the CO2. But once we talk about this internal respiration, this internal respiration is the exchange that is taking place between the blood capillaries found in the tissue. Yes, you're right, that systemic capillary and the tissues. That's when you actually upload all the CO2 from the tissue into the blood and you unload all the oxygen that you actually bought now and you're unloading that oxygen from the blood to the tissue. So upload of CO2, unload of oxygen is internal and upload of O2, unload of CO2 is in external respiration. So that's about breathing and respiration. Definitions. How do we know which organs are, uh, which animals are having, which respiratory structures and this and that. So according to your NCRT, they have given two bases of having any respiratory structures. One basis of having different respiratory structure is number one on the basis of habitat. Now when you talk about the habitat, whether the animals are living in the water or they are living on the lands, according to that, their respiratory structure varies. Now the number one is aquatic. So when you are talking about aquatic animals, most of the aquatic animals, they are respiring with the help of gills. Like the fish, very common that you know. And the kind of respiration is called as branchial respiration. So don't get confused if they ask you branchial respiration. Branchial respiration means the respiration with the help of gills. When you are talking about terrestrial animals, most of the terrestrial animals, they are respiring by lungs. And when you say lungs, that respiration is called as pulmonary respiration. Is it clear? Now moving on to the second basis of having different respiratory structures is the level of organization. L-O-O -O stands for level of organization. 
you know in animal kingdom you study different level of organization animal may have cellular grade of organization tissue grade of organization organ grade of organization and organ system grade of organization we know that in lower animals in the lower invertebrates they don't have very well developed respiratory structures right so definitely they will won't be respiring by very well developed respiratory structures so let's now just see on the basis of this level of organization what do they have talking about the number one Porifera having cellular grade of organization, Coelentrata or Tenophora having tissue grade of organization, or talking about Platyhelminthes which has got organ grade of organization. These are the lower invertebrates. They respire by general body surface. Organ system grade of organization is of different different animals. Now organ system grade of organization for example Arthropoda, Annelida or you know going up to chordates they also have got different different respiratory structures. Now looking upon organ system grade of organization you have earthworm star mark the earthworm because sometimes it might ask you know in this chapter also it is important in animal kingdom also this is important earthworm is very very important respiratory structure is the moist cuticle the moist cuticle which is secreted by the epidermis in fact if this moist cuticle if, they, if this dries up it might even lead to the death of the earthworm Insects, you have studied cockroach. Cockroach respires with the help of a tracheal system. So the insects are using the tracheal system for respiration. Talking about fish, already discussed that they respire using gills. Talking about amphibians, amphibians are having the most diverse respiratory structures. They might respire using gills, they may use their lungs, they may use their skin, they may use their buccopharynx. The tadpole larva, which is the larval stage of amphibians, it actually respires using the gills. And in the adult stages, the frog, it may respire using these structures. Talking about reptile, birds and mammals, we very well know that we use our lungs for the respiration. Now students, the very important part of the chapter is the human respiratory system, alright? So let us now discuss about the different different parts of the respiratory system. I have mentioned all the parts in a flow chart, okay? So there is a flow chart starting from the, you know, first part and ending up to the last part. I have written everything on the board except the features of all the parts okay the features of all the parts i would be dictating it all right now let's start with the first part we are starting with the two structures that you see over upper lips those two structures visible from outside through which you are inhaling the air is external nostrils the external nostrils you can also use the term nares external nostrils or external nares are the two pair one pair of opening present above the upper lip through which is air entering and it is passing to the chamber which has several important function now you have got nasal chamber or nasal cavity which is lined by different types of epithelium like pseudo sterified epithelium it is also having the mucus secreting goblet cells and you know that the goblet cells producing mucus inside your nasal cavity is going to trap all the dust particles right and it is going to not allow the dust particles to go inside your body also your nasal cavity has fine hair that helps in little movement the other function of the nasal cavity is that whenever the air is going to enter the air has a different temperature than your body temperature but it is brought to your body temperature inside your nasal chamber or nasal cavity also the air is humidified as it coming into the nasal chamber so different different function humidification of air brings to the body temperature 
mucus cell producing, the mucus trapping the dust particles are several important functions of your nasal cavity. So external nostrils leading to your nasal chamber and just like you have two openings outside your body, this nasal chamber also opens posteriorly into two openings which is called as internal nares or internal nostrils. Now internal nostrils leads to the part of pharynx that we have discussed in the digestion chapter that pharynx has got different different parts. The internal nares opening into a part of pharynx is called as the nasopharynx. Now nasopharynx leads to this larynx which is quite a bit you know has different different characteristics you know that we are able to speak and we are studying since you know uh, uh, high, junior classes that larynx is called as your voice box. This larynx is called as the voice box. It helps in the production of sound. And this larynx is made up of cartilage. It is made up of cartilage. And how many cartilage it is having? It is having nine cartilage. You know one of the cartilage of larynx that is epiglottis. Epiglottis is a cartilaginous flap that prevents the entry of food into your respiratory passage. Getting my point? Now how this larynx is helping in sound production is because this voice box, this sound box is having the vocal cords and when you vibrate the vocal cords that's when the sound is produced. Now I would like to give you just a general information, might, you might be familiar with this when you talk about a female and you talk about a male so there is a difference in the pitch of the voice. So the pitch of the voice of a female is very very high, is it because we shout? Oh, of course not alright sometimes the pitch of the male can be higher because of shouting so it's nothing like that the um, pitch of the female is higher because of the difference in the vocal cords that we have when compared to a male the males having the vocal cords their vocal cord is comparatively thicker their vocal cord is thicker under the influence of the testosterone male hormones whereas the females are having thinner vocal cords all right so we have got different different pitch of the voice and the vocal cords are related with the voice box larynx now larynx leads to the trachea that is actually called as the windpipe Trachea leads to primary bronchi which further divides into secondary bronchi. Now bronchi and bronchus. When you say bronchus that's the singular when you are saying bronchi that's plural. That leads to ter tertiary bronchi and finally leads to terminal bronchioles. So I've ended this red color over here. And do you see any part I've written it conducting. Starting from your external nostrils up to some parts of your initial bronchioles, it's the conducting part. It's the conducting part. Now, talking about some of the features of the trachea, you know that your trachea doesn't collapse while you are breathing because they are lined by some specific cartilaginous rings and these incomplete cartilaginous rings that is present over the trachea is preventing the collapse of the windpipe all right but do you know that these cartilaginous rings are they present in the primary bronchi definitely yes are they present in secondary yes are they present in tertiary definitely yes are they present in terminal bronchioles actually bronchioles are having two parts the one part of bronchioles is the all is coming in the exchange part initial part of bronchioles are also lined by incomplete cartilaginous rings so make a point somewhere that the cartilaginous rings are starting from the trachea and they are present up to initial bronchioles they are present up to initial bronchioles i hope this is clear to all of you in NCRT, they have also, also mentioned that trachea, since this is the trachea, that is the windpipe, this trachea is dividing into two parts. Those two parts 
on left and right side is the primary bronchi but at the level of which vertebrae if you compare it with your vertebral column at the level of which vertebrae is it dividing so at the level of fifth thoracic vertebrae now make this point clear at the level of fifth thoracic vertebrae the trachea is dividing into the primary bronchi i hope this is clear fifth thoracic vertebrae it is dividing into primary bronchi now moving on to the next part from external nostrils till some part of the bronchioles was your conducting zone was conducting the air but the major function of the respiratory system is the exchange of gas right now the exchange is taking place from the parts which is called as alveoli right but from the bronchioles it leads to respiratory bronchioles that leads to alveolar duct and finally it leads to alveolar sac so from the respiratory bronchioles to the alveolar duct and to the alveolar sac the part is called as the exchange zone now in this area i have just you know written it in the gist that the conducting zone and the exchange zone is composed of what parts so the conducting zone starts from your external nostrils up to some bronchioles and the exchange zone which is also called as the respiratory zone starts from your respiratory bronchi and ends with the alveoli make sure that the cartilaginous rings are starting from the trachea and it is present in the primary bronchi secondary bronchi tertiary bronchi up to initial bronchioles and the trachea is dividing at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebrae all right now let's start with the next part that is the lungs which is very very important again to know the function of the lungs that's how you're going to know the different different activities that you are performing using this now talking about lungs you've got two lungs the right lung and the left lung all right now these lungs are present in the cavity which is called as the thoracic cavity now let let us look at what this thoracic cavity is exactly made of now when you look at your thoracic cavity what it is made of which the lungs which is present inside it this thoracic cavity is formed on dorsal side by your vertebral column on ventral side you have this breast bone which is called as sternum and laterally what you have is the ribs so this is what exactly i have written dorsally the vertebral column is used ventrally the sternum is used and laterally it is covered by ribs so this entire thing in fact you can sometimes say that on lower side you have got the muscular diaphragm this entirely is forming your thoracic cavity in which you have got lungs now lungs is a visceral organ like your heart and everything and your lungs is covered by a double membranous membrane that double membranous structure is called as i've written it over here it is called as pleural membrane also your pleural membrane do not stick together right when you breathe when your lungs expand the double membranous pleural membrane is not going to stick together because of the presence of a fluid which is called as the pleural fluid which is having some pressure now talking about these two membrane on outside it has a different name and on inside it has a different name the outer pleural membrane is called as the outer parietal pleura whereas the inner membrane is called as inner visceral pleura the visceral pleura since it is towards the inside it is present towards the lungs talking about the parietal pleura it is present outside and outside when i say definitely it is present towards the thoracic cavity now why do you need to know the thoracic cavity exactly is because students whenever there is a change in the volume of the thoracic cavity any change in the uh, thoracic cavity is directly going to be reflected in your lungs now we are going to start with the very very important topics you know topic of your uh, this chapter also i would like to say you that the entire respiration entire breathing is divided into certain parts i would first tell you all these steps involved and then we are going to take up all the parts separately 
first step in your entire thing is you need to inhale right so you are inhaling you are breathing so first step is breathing now when you took a lot of air inside you the second step would be the exchange but this exchange of gases will be from your alveoli to your blood capillary you have exchanged all your gas now what do you need to do is you need to transport this gas to the tissue that's the third step while you transport this oxygen transport the air to the tissues you need to again exchange this air from the systemic capillaries to the tissues that's the third step i have not written these steps students but i will be writing all these steps separately while i will be discussing each one of them now after you have exchanged the gases again between the systemic capillary and the tissues the tissues ultimately is going to utilize that oxygen and produce you with energy now let's start with the very first topic which is the mechanism of breathing now to know the mechanism of breathing you need to understand how the air is coming inside or how the air is going outside so the basic principle behind this breathing is the pressure difference when i say the air air always moves from a region of high partial pressure to a region of low partial pressure so wherever you need to move the air there the pressure should be low right but students the problem is pressure outside is always fixed pressure outside is always fixed so you can't change that pressure now whenever you need to change the pressure inside your body what you can do is change your volume and how this is helping in breathing that i'm going to discuss when i will be starting with the first breathing step that is the inhalation process i have given you with some data just remember the data that breathing which means inhalation and exhalation inhalation is for 2 seconds and exhalation is for 3 seconds so total one time you have got 5 seconds the breathing rate in the adults it 12 to 16 times per minute and for infants it is 44 times per minute now we were discussing that you need to change the pressure if you need to either inhale or exhale because the pressure outside is fixed you can't change the pressure now talking about the first step which is the normal inhalation you need to inhale the air students now you when you need to inhale air i told you that air is going to move from a region of high partial pressure to a region of low partial pressure so when you need to inhale the air inside pressure should be low that's what i have written p outside is fixed but p inside should be low how the p inside should be low you can change the pressure by changing the volume i said you know very well in chemistry you have read that boyle's law says that pressure is inversely proportional to volume you can easily change the pressure if you can change the volume now in this case when you need the inside pressure should be low what you need is to increase the volume right now you can do that using two muscles so one is your diaphragm and other i have written students as external icm which stands for external intercostal muscles whenever you are going to contract talking about this part your diaphragm is having dome shape like this when it is having dome shape and you need to inhale what i am doing is i am contracting this diaphragm just look at my hand when i am contracting my diaphragm how it is becoming it is becoming flat do you see some increase in the volume initially it was this much now when i have uh, contracted it it is becoming dome uh, it is becoming flat from dome shape there is an increase in volume that's what i have written contraction becomes flat from dome shape volume is increased but the direction of the increase in the volume is anterior posterior there is a increase in the volume in the anterior posterior direction so when the volume is increased when the volume increases pressure ultimately decreases and that's what i have written that the pressure decreases and when pressure decreases air can ultimately come inside this was the role of diaphragm and students very important to note here that diaphragm contraction leads to increase in which direction of volume that's anterior posterior now talking about this part external intercostal muscles where are these external intercostal muscles located these muscles are located within your ribs 
right now whenever you're contracting your external intercostal muscles what is happening is your ribs and your sternum is moving outwards and upwards it is moving outwards and upwards can you see initially it was like this when it moves outward there is again an increase in volume but this time the increase in volume is dorso ventral right and when there is an increase in volume ultimately your pressure decreases so diaphragm anterior posterior volume increasing Contracting your external intercostal muscles, your ribs and sternum, moving outward, upwards, increasing the volume dorsal ventrally, pressure is decreasing, air can come inside. That's the process of normal inhalation. Remember the muscles, it's external intercostal muscles, not the internal intercostal muscles. Now students, there is a question that whether it is an active process or a passive process. So when you say inhalation, normal inhalation, since you are contracting the muscles, normal inhalation would be an active process. Alright, now let's talk about the next process which is normal exhalation. Now students, normal exhalation is quite easy because it is exactly opposite to normal inhalation. For exhaling air, definitely your pressure inside should be very very high. That's what I have written that the pressure inside should be high. Pressure outside is fixed. You need a more pressure and to change the pressure, again what you're gonna do is change the volume. Whatever you have contracted in your inhalation process, normal inhalation process, relax it. Now I am talking about these two muscles again, the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. When you relax your diaphragm, your diaphragm in it was flat. Now when you are relaxing it, it is again becoming dome shape. Do you see change in volume? The change in volume, decrease in volume is in the anterior posterior direction. So it is again becoming dome shape. Volume is decreased in anterior posterior direction. Pressure is increased. In the same way, when your external intercostal muscles are relaxing, initially the ribs and uh, sternum was outward. When this is relaxing, the ribs and sternum is moving inward and downward. Do you see change in a volume? The change in the volume is again in the direction dorsal ventral the pressure is increasing ultimately by both using both you are increasing the pressure once you increase the pressure air goes out forcefully uh, uh, normally when the air is when you are relaxing the muscles air is going outside normally now why am i saying this is because can you see the comparison of two things that i have mentioned on the board one is the normal exhalation and other is the forceful exhalation i have written over normal exhalation it's a passive process now students when you have relaxed all the muscles what is happening is all the things becoming normal diaphragm becoming dome shaped back ribs and sternum moving inside since you're not contracting any muscles this is a passive process talking about the other side we're talking about the forceful exhalation why i have written it as active process is because you will see that forceful exhalation contracts some muscles unlike the normal exhalation where you only relax the muscles now what are the muscles involved remember this muscle is very very important we did not mention about the internal intercostal muscles anywhere now when you are contracting the abdominal muscles the volume is again decreasing anterior posteriorly pressure is increasing way too much Pressure when is increasing, the air can go outside forcefully. But not only your abdominal muscles, when you are contracting your internal intercostal muscles, what is happening is volume is decreasing, dorsal ventrally, pressure is increasing and air can go outside. So internal intercostal muscles are contracting when you need to forcefully exhale out air. And since you are contracting the muscles, your forceful exhalation will be active process. Now, students, let's move to the uh, next star mark I have written a lot of times because this topic which I'm going to discuss now is very, very important for NEET. As you can see, I'm talking about respiratory volumes and respiratory capacity. And can you see NEET 2019, 2018, 2017, twice. So many questions were asked from this topic. So please pay attention to this part. Okay. I've made a graph. And I would request all of you, please don't consider this as a graph of physics, okay? This is a graph of zoology, understand in that way only. That will be quite easy for all of you. Don't consider X and Y axis and all that. Anyway, 
talking about beta respiratory volumes respiratory volumes and there is a term respiratory capacity so when you say respiratory volumes these volumes are actually defined as the different amount of air that you can inhale or you can exhale or that is present in the lungs in different conditions okay in different conditions the air that is inhaled or exhaled is respiratory volumes combining these volumes what you can do is you can uh, understand about the respiratory capacities now very important to first understand this graph okay but i would want you to relate this graph with the respiratory volumes once you understand this respiratory volumes and the graph very easy to know the respiratory capacities also remember whenever i am using the term forceful whenever i am using the term normal pay attention to that okay all right now when you look at this graph whenever the graph is going on top this much whenever the graph is going up this much you will always say that is normal inhalation okay whenever is going graph is going down this much down this much you will say that it is normal exhalation so this above going is normal inhalation this downwards going is normal exhalation again normal inhalation again normal exhalation all right now this is more than sufficient to understand all the respiratory volumes now let's talk about the first respiratory volume which is tidal volume tidal volume now listen to the definition first it is the amount of air that a person can normally inhale or normally exhale now pay attention to normally inhale or normally exhale so i've shown you in this graph that a person can inhale this much or exhale this much so normal either inhale or normally exhale that is the tidal volume so i've written it as tv this is the amount of air that we can either normally inhale or normally exhale which you can see among the total graph is the lowest volume remember that the amount is 500 ml and among all the respiratory volume it is having the lowest value now what is this in your ncert there is a data given that in tidal volume itself it is 6000 to 8000 but they have written it as per minute actually there is a term called as minute respiratory volume which is mrv minute respiratory volume equals to tidal volume into breathing rate so br stands for breathing rate and tv stands for tidal volume breathing rate we have discussed it that adults it is 12 to 16 times per minute when you multiply it with 500 ml which is tidal volume volume it comes around 6000 to 8000 ml all right so this is minute respiratory volume now talking about the next definition which is inspiratory reserved volume irv inspiratory reserved volume okay you can do it in your home itself can you take in some more air after you normally inhale now this is normal inhalation now i can take some more air even after normal inhalation that is like this so that is forceful inhalation can you see in this graph that if i say beta what is this so this amount will be the normal inhalation but can you see that this much amount of air that you can forcefully inhale so this much amount of air which after normal inhalation you can forcefully intake is called as irv or inspiratory reserved volume its value is 2500 ml to 3000 ml which is highest among all other respiratory volumes now is it clear moving on to the next respiratory volume that is the expiratory reserved volume now again just like after normal inhalation you can forcefully inhale some air exactly like that when you normally exhale still you can forcefully exhale out some air called as expiratory reserved volume the additional amount of air a person can exhale forcefully now can you see again in this graph this amount of air was the amount which you normally exhale but do you see this amount which you can forcefully exhale called as expiratory reserved volume value is 1000 to 1100 ml 
even after using all your muscles even after doing forceful exhalation still some amount of air will be present in your lungs it is never going to come outside that amount is called as residual volume that's value is 1100 ml to 1200 ml so even after forceful exhalation this much this much amount of air is still present in your lungs and this amount which is still present in your lungs is called as residual volume which is never going to come out now which device is used to measure all these respiratory volumes students the device that you use to measure all the respiratory volumes is pyrometer it is pyrometer but spirometer can measure all the respiratory volumes except the residual volume it cannot measure the residual volume but all other volumes it can measure even in the capacities remember wherever the residual volume will come spirometer won't be able to measure that so this is about the respiratory volumes when we are going to combine this respiratory volumes we are going to talk about then the different respiratory capacities now students we will be discussing about the different respiratory capacities in our next class before starting with the respiratory capacities make sure you read all the definitions of the respiratory capacities you study this graph properly and then that would be quite very very easy to understand the different respiratory capacities till then take care bye bye stay happy